Hello and welcome to another video trying to get you the top grades at GCSE. So I'm going to delve into the themes of Macbeth. Uh, there are eight of them, as you can see, that I'm going to cover here. And if you understand all eight of these, the chances of getting a grade eight or higher are really, really good. It's going to be a long video because I want to take you through all eight, but I'm going to keep it under 30 minutes. And this could be the only revision that you do for the exam. That's not the best way to revise, but if you're thinking, I haven't got much time, this is the video for you. Right, let's kick off with Ambition, which you might have seen was Macbeth's Hamartia. Now, Hamartia, for those of you who don't know, means the fatal flaw. It comes from Greek tragedy. So Macbeth's tragic fatal flaw is seen by many to be his ambition. And he references it himself. Um, so he says, I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, um, meaning that he's he's got this ambition, this intent, but the only thing that's going to make him do it is missing. He doesn't have the spur, only vaulting ambition. Well, many people think the spur is in fact Lady Macbeth, and he knows he needs her help uh, to reach that ambition. And this is her reaction when she finds out about the witch's promises. Um, these, this is what he tells her. What greatness is promised thee? So he offers these promises from the witches to try and entice his wife into spurring him on. Uh, so we can see this as an equal partnership between the two. Um, he calls her my dearest partner of greatness and he needs her to help him realise that ambition. And you could argue that that's why Shakespeare kills them both at the end, um, because they're equally responsible for the killing of Duncan and the tragedy that unfolds. Right, well now we have a bit more an unusual point about ambition, and it's about Banquo. Many people see Banquo as a wholly good character, but we look at when the witches first appear, um, he just doesn't leave them to tell whatever they want to tell to Macbeth. He says, um, speak, speak to me. Say which grain will grow and which will not. Speak them to me. He is also ambitious for himself and wants to find out what the future might hold. Now, if we go a little further into, into Banquo's character, that ambition is also his Hamartia, because um, he says to Macbeth that night, I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. In other words, he's so ambitious, he's dreamt of the weird sisters even before they meet with Macbeth and Banquo on the blasted heath. Now, many people don't notice this, but it, it's an indication to us that Shakespeare is saying, look, all good men can be destroyed by their ambition. Um, and Banquo has it. He has dreamt about them before even Macbeth has met them. Uh, well, they meet together before Macbeth plans to kill Duncan. And uh, Macbeth basically offers Banquo a, a bribe. He says, if you shall cleave to my consent, so if you'll do what I want you to do, uh, when it is, it shall make honour for you. So you'll get titles, um, you'll become Thane of whatever, just like I am, you'll be close to me. And Banquo doesn't say, no, I'm not interested in that. Interested in that, he says, but still keep my bosom franchised and allegiance clear, I shall be counselled. So he's hedging his bets here because he doesn't know what's going to happen. But he's clearly signalling to Macbeth that he would be interested in such an arrangement. Well, in the end, uh, Macbeth proceeds and kills Duncan without including Banquo, which leaves Banquo the only choice of sacrificing himself so that his own sons will become king. Um, but that's no less ambitious, and it leads to his destruction. Uh, so just as Macbeth is destroyed by his ambition, so is Banquo. Yes, it looks like a noble sacrifice because he dies for his son, but it's not necessarily done purely out of love. 
it's also done out of ambition of having his family name carry on forever. Now, another point that most people don't really realise is the ambition of the witches. What's in it for them? Um, why do they pick on Macbeth? Well, according to Hecate, um, who gives them a real dressing down, a real telling off, she, she says, and which is worse, all you have done hath been for a wayward son. So Macbeth is described as a wayward son, spiteful and wrathful, who, as others do, loves for his own ends, not for you. So now the Hamartia is presented in a new light. The Hamartia appears to be love. The witches cannot achieve any form of love because they are so ugly. They're outcast from society. Uh, they're presumably poor. Uh, no one will want to marry them. No one will love them. And so they turn to witchcraft in order to replace that missing hole. They simply want to be loved. And we could argue that they achieve that aim. Macbeth does seek them out again. He does love what they offer him. And if you like, he keeps turning to them as objects of his desire. Um, however, Hecate is right. He only loves them for his own ends, not for themselves. Um, and Shakespeare here could be talking about how marginalised women are in society. Um, what they really want is love and understanding, but what they get is an arranged marriage and um, security through political alliance, not through love. And this leads us to Shakespeare's great criticism of his society, that it is a patriarchy, one in which uh, women are exploited and not given uh, proper identities or power. So when Lady Macbeth wants to become more powerful, she has to become more masculine in this society. And this society associates masculinity with cruelty. Uh, so she calls upon the spirits to unsex her, literally take away her womanhood. And she associates this, becoming masculine, with becoming cruel. Uh, and in fact, she asks for the milk of her mother's um, her mother's milk from her breast to be taken and turned into poison. And this uh, is a metaphor for what society does to women. If they want to achieve any kind of power, um, Shakespeare is arguing, they are forced to behave in ways that appear unnatural and are therefore rejected by society. And next, Shakespeare says this is damaging to men in society as well. So Macbeth responds to the idea of killing Duncan by saying, I dare do all that may become a man who dares do more is none. Uh, I can't go as far as regicide, he's saying. But Shakespeare is positing the idea that if a society celebrates a cruel form of masculinity, and after all, that's what Macbeth has shown in battle, and that's what everybody has praised about him, um, the savagery of his winning the battle, um, it's then just a very small step to continuing that savagery in the rest of life. It creates the kind of ambition that Macbeth has, um, which is after the ornament of life, the ultimate symbol of power, kingship. So the tragedy now becomes the kind of patriarchal society they live in. Living in the patriarchy forces men to behave in a much more ruthless way. Well, the main audience for Shakespeare's play is not what you'd expect. It's not paying members of the public. His main audience for this play is actually the king and the nobles at court. Uh, so Shakespeare is very careful to put in some messages about what good kingship should be like. Uh, so Malcolm is first not a very good king in waiting. He criticises Macduff for not being manly enough when he hears about the slaughtering of his whole family. And he says to Macduff, dispute it like a man, as in pull yourself together. But Macduff teaches him a lesson about what masculinity should be. I shall do so, but I must also feel it as a man. Uh, so when we get to the end of the play, we get to uh, a part that's often um, not studied at all, 
where Seward, one of Malcolm's allies, just lost his son fighting. And Seward uh, doesn't show any regret that his son has died. He's just delighted that his son had died with wounds on his front, which meant he didn't die a coward. He died nobly in battle. And Malcolm turns to him and says, he's worth more sorrow and that I'll spend for him. So Malcolm has learnt what masculinity should be like. It should be compassionate. It should be full of fellow feeling. And Shakespeare gives these words to the man who's just about to become king. Why? Because he's got a coded message here to King James. This is what a king should be like. And the reason that's important, of course, is the great trouble in the country at the time with oppression of Catholics. And Shakespeare doesn't want James to turn into a kind of tyrant like Macbeth. He wants him to be much more forgiving and understanding like Malcolm. And now this brings us to the greater theme of kingship, the divine right of kings. Um, because sitting in court will be, no doubt, many um, nobles or several nobles who don't want King James as their king who don't think that he has any entitlement to be there because Queen Elizabeth died without an heir. And also, you'll have others who come from Catholic families who are now pretending to be Protestant because it's illegal to be a Catholic, but actually still practice Catholicism at home. And so they would be King James's natural enemies, uh, even though there they are at court. Uh, so Shakespeare wants to promote the idea of the divine right of kings, which pretty much meant God, the divine, appointed the king, and whatever mortals thought about it was irrelevant. Now, you couldn't really go against the word of God. Um, once we look at that, he then creates this character, Duncan, to be someone who is completely virtuous. Again, a reminder to King James about what sort of king he should be to make it easier for people to accept him as the divine choice. He's also, however, Shakespeare that is, warning the potential rebels at court not to proceed further. So Macbeth has a chance not to proceed. He says, we but teach bloody instructions which being taught return to play the inventor. In other words, when he starts killing people, uh, especially the nobles, it teaches all the surviving nobles that this is actually something you can get away with, and therefore they could get away with killing Macbeth. Um, and the, the message there is, look, remember the gunpowder plot, if it had succeeded in killing King James, it wouldn't have led to a better world. It would just have led to a world in which the next conspirators could come along and think, well, let's get rid of the next king and get the one that we want. It would only teach bloody instructions. And Shakespeare presents himself as a lover of peace, and he wants to keep the status quo. He then has Malcolm um, fake this idea of um, what a, a terrible king he would be. He's testing Macduff here, and that scene really has no relevance to a modern audience at all and is usually cut. But to Shakespeare, the crucial thing about that is he's now exploring again the consequences of being the wrong kind of king. So he's telling King James, look, you could cut off the nobles from their lands. You could invent quarrels that were unjust against the good and loyal, destroy them and then take their wealth and their lands. Yes, we all know you could do that, but actually that will backfire on you in the end. Don't be that kind of king. And it's also a warning to any plotters that um, the new king, who would replace James could be like that. Uh, now, next, uh, Shakespeare has to make sure that Banquo appears quite noble, despite the ambition he has that I alluded to earlier. Uh, so he does that by describing Banquo as having a royalty of nature. Now, this is important because Banquo was thought at the time to be the uh, ancient ancestor of King James. Um, so James believed he was descended from Banquo, and so it was important to have Banquo as the, the
the origin of James, if you like, being presented in a really good light, hence the royalty of nature. And he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valour to act in safety. So on the one hand, he's describing uh, Banquo's cunning here, having wisdom uh, and the bravery of acting safely rather than rashly. Um, but this is also another coded message to King James, um, doing nothing, uh, not um, going out for vengeance against the Catholics, isn't stupidity. That's actually wisdom. It's actually bravery. That's what valor means. Acting in safety, taking your time, is actually a sign of good kingship. So this is again another way that he's trying to influence King James not to take any rash actions in revenge. And what does Shakespeare offer in return? Well, he appeals to King James's ambition. Uh, and so when, he, when um, Macbeth goes back to the witches, what they show him is a vision of Banquo's descendants that will stretch out to the crack of doom. Doom here is doomsday. That's when um, the world is destroyed and we've got Judgment Day. And so what Shakespeare is suggesting here is that King James could become such a good king that his descendants will stay on the throne forever. Now, this is obviously a blatant form of flattery. Certainly in Shakespeare's time, if you looked back over the history of the kings and queens of England, you would have seen one royal dynasty destroyed by another going back hundreds of years. You know, dynasties simply didn't last beyond a few generations. Uh, but that's the potential prize that Shakespeare is offering to King James. You could be different to every other dynasty, he's saying. Yours could survive forever, if only you're the kind of king I think you should be. Um, watch my plays, find out what kind of man you should be, and what are the consequences for being like Macbeth. So when we see the play this way, uh, we can understand that um, Shakespeare's two main motives are to stop any rebellion against King James, and also to stop King James becoming a vicious ruler who will therefore encourage rebellion. So this is why we have this great description of Macbeth's tyranny in Scotland, because it invites the audience to imagine what tyranny would look like in England. Um, and then the message about the gunpowder plot to King James, not to act viciously, is to get King James to think about his future. And this is why uh, Macbeth thinks about his future before he's going to die. He says, and that which should accompany old age as honour, love, obedience, troops of friends, I must not look to have. And so he's telling King James what King James himself risks losing. Um, this and many other contextual factors ask many readers and many scholars to think, well, was Shakespeare himself a Catholic? Did he have an alternative motive for stopping King James um, becoming a tyrannical leader who would seek to expose, torture and kill Catholics? Um, was he acting in self-interest, protecting himself uh, and his family? Well, next we have some themes which are not collect connected to the politics of the time, but are actually Shakespeare's artistic exploration of how he actually sees the world. Um, so the King's players who came before Shakespeare um, did perform some plays about um, historical kings and queens of England, but they were basically um, political intrigues that just showed the facts of the battle and who won and who lost. Um, Shakespeare's writing takes playwriting to a completely new level and he kind of invents psychology. I mean nobody had that word at the time but the meaning of it explaining why people think the way they do um, the workings of the inner mind is something that Shakespeare dramatizes for the first time. So he's virtually the first playwright to invent the soliloquy where characters speak their innermost thoughts to the audience so we can literally see the mind at work. Well, there are all kinds of other ways in which Shakespeare is really interested in exploit, uh, exploring the work of the mind. So there's Banquo's dream. How does he dream about the witches 
before they even appear. Is that a sign of their supernatural power, as many would assume? Or is it a sign of how Banquo's ambition is taking over his mind so that he's starting to believe the impossible? He couldn't have dreamt about them before they appeared. Um, this is his mind fracturing just as Lady Macbeth's mind fractures and just as Macbeth's mind fractures. The first sign of Macbeth's fracturing mind is the vision of the dagger that he sees before him. It's not really there. Um, but this is the fracture that's going on in his psyche, in his brain, because he's going to go against his better nature. Uh, so yes, there's a morality here. Shakespeare is suggesting that if you go against what you know is good, it will ultimately destroy your mind. But he's also interested in how we become disconnected from ourselves and also how we invent alternative realities to justify ourselves. So the next line about the dagger is it's pointing me the way that I intended to go. I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, Macbeth sees the dagger as an excuse. Oh, well, the dagger's here and it's pointing me to what I've got to do. Therefore, I've got to do it. Uh, similarly, when he says he will sleep no more, um, he imagines a voice has said this, but this is actually his own mind telling him, look, there are consequences, um, mental consequences to what you're about to do, and you won't be able to rest again if you do it. Um, Banquo's ghost is a similar warning. Many people at the time would have seen that as another supernatural apparition, a real ghost, the powers of um, evil at work again in the world, uh, in a world that could believe in witches, why not? But Shakespeare is actually much more interested in the human context here. The ghost is only there because Macbeth can imagine the ghost, and therefore it's a product of his own mind. And Shakespeare is interested in how the mind gets damaged. And in this play, it's against, it's when, it, when you go against your own better nature. Uh, Lady Macbeth sleepwalking is again a sign of her fractured mind. But what's happened to fracture it here um, isn't just that she's had to go against her better nature. It's that society has forced her to do that. The only way she can become powerful and have meaning in the world is through the acts of men. And so she has to um, learn to manipulate men in order to be successful in life. And those very qualities are the ones that therefore lead to her own tragedy. Um, then that image of her imagining the smell of blood is fascinating because she is actually becoming Macbeth here. He is the one who couldn't wash the um, blood off his hands after he killed Duncan. Lady Macbeth had no issue with it. She said a little water clears us of this deed. And so her mind is so fractured that she starts to take on Macbeth's guilt and Macbeth's psychology. And then finally, we have Macduff, whose mind is haunted by the fact that he left his wife and children. Again, this links us to the theme of masculinity. He acted as a warrior, acting impulsively, um, went off to join up with Malcolm to fight this noble fight, but in so doing left his wife and family utterly defenceless. And if he'd just thought about this, he'd surely have taken them with him from Scotland. In fact, his wife says as much before she's slaughtered. Um, and therefore they come back to haunt him. His own fractured mind will not forgive him. So, the psychology of guilt is really, really powerful here. And Shakespeare is suggesting, look, we'll all be destroyed by the things that we know we shouldn't do. Um, that is his artistic vision, but it also matches with his political vision, where again, he's trying to warn King James at every opportunity not to act in ways that would go against his own better nature, not to suffer that guilt. Next, Shakespeare explores the whole idea of whether our lives are controlled by fate or controlled by free will. So in classical literature from Greece and then later from Rome, the fates are portrayed as three women, a virgin, a mature woman and an old crone. 
and they are the three fates who control our lives. Uh, so Shakespeare explores this in some detail in the play. Um, you're familiar with the prophecies, but the key line here is Macbeth's. If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me. In other words, I don't have to do anything to accelerate my fate. Um, I can just allow things to happen. I don't have to exercise my free will in any kind of violent way just to prove that I have it. All the later prophecies um, mock the idea of fate and actually suggest that free will is the most important um, element of being a human here. So, for example, when Macbeth is told that he will never be beaten until Great Burnham Wood to High Dunsinane Hill shall come against him, seems like a supernatural prophecy. But actually, if you're laying siege to a castle with an army, um, you don't want the defenders in the castle to know which wall you're going to put your main attackers on, and so you camouflage yourselves. Well, it must have been very common at the time to use uh, branches from trees in order to camouflage the numbers of the army. It wouldn't have been a bizarre military tactic. It would have been something that we could foresee. So not much of a prophecy at all. Uh, similarly, the prophecy to beware Macduff. Well, it's pretty obvious that Macduff um, was going to be an enemy of Macbeth because um, he didn't turn up to the banquet celebrating uh, his coronation and he, he fled to England. It's obvious what he was doing. So again, no prophecy needed there. And then when Macbeth is told that no man born a woman can kill him, that seems impossible and therefore supernatural. And then Macduff's uh, confession that, well, I was, I was from my mother's womb untimely writ, is ridiculous. Um, all women would have died uh, as a result of a cesarean birth at this stage but that didn't make them any less of a woman. Uh, so Macduff is still born of a woman, and what leads Macbeth to be killed by Macduff is his own free will. Ironically, he freely chooses to believe in his fate, um, and so he lets Macduff defeat him. Um, yes, Macbeth would have been defeated anyway, um, but was that really fate? No, it was the action of his free will, when he taught bloody instruction by killing Duncan. Um, and so when I read the play, my overwhelming feeling is that, that Shakespeare himself didn't believe in fate at all. He totally believed that one's actions could lead to success or failure. And if you look at the extraordinary success of Shakespeare's life, rising from um, a little backwater town called Stratford um, with a you know, not much of a family behind him, to becoming the main dramatist of his day with the ear of the king, you can see why psychologically it would be really attractive to Shakespeare to believe that his own success was based on his cunning, his wisdom, um, his genius as a writer, and not that he was somehow fated to do well and it was outside his control. Another theme that links with the divine right of kings is the idea of violence breeding violence. Again, this is a, a plea to King James not to become a violent king. Um, and I've pretty much covered that. I won't go through these quotations. Uh, you can see my video on that if you want that in more depth, but we've covered it very well in this video. This theme about... Uh, reality and appearance is one of the most <coughs> popular ones to be examined on in this play um, and there are two kinds of ways into this one is Shakespeare as the artist and dramatist so his whole life is based on creating an illusion plays if you like are illusions and we all enter into them willingly um, and what Shakespeare is interested in here isn't about fooling the audience He's interested in how this illusion actually leads to a greater truth. So when you see something that is made up, um, it actually offers you a more real picture than real life itself because it introduces the idea of layers. Um, layers and different ways of interpreting life. That's why he has these lines, fair is foul and foul is flair. It all depends on your perspective. When the battle's lost and won, 
So the victory for one person um, might, in the long run, turn out to be a defeat. There's Then we've got um, the psychological reasons why we fool ourselves. So we've got this castle hath a pleasant seat, says Duncan, just as he's about to be murdered in it. Um, we, we fool ourselves when we should know better. And the real, um, the most powerful way of expressing this is Shakespeare actually questions God here. He says, angels are bright still, though the brightest fell. In other words, even God was uh, able to fool himself that Satan was still a good angel, in fact, the best, the brightest angel, up until the very moment when Satan chose um, to behave um, evilly and rebel against God. So Shakespeare is suggesting that God should have been able to see that uh, um, Satan was going to turn out to be a traitor, but he didn't because, like Duncan, we all fool ourselves. Um, we all think that we're wise enough to see the world as it is. Uh, and then that takes us to the next reason that Shakespeare is fascinated by reality and appearance, and that's because of the political situation at the time. This is a time that's uh, full of spies, uh, full of intrigue, and the most hot topic is whether or not you're a Catholic, because if you are a Catholic, by association, you will be seen as potentially part of a future gunpowder plot. Um, and so the idea of traitors being everywhere is uppermost in everyone's mind, which is why Duncan says there's no art to find the man's construction in the face. And it's why Macbeth says false face must hide what the false heart doth know. So the audience would be completely engaged by this because it's at the heart of politics at the time. And Shakespeare is writing for this political audience. He's not writing this play just for the commoner who's going to pay um, a penny to come and watch it. This is being performed at court amongst the nobility. And then the final part of um, this ambiguity is whether Shakespeare is interested in this theme because he desperately wants to convince the king that he has nothing to do uh, with those who might plot against him, but rather is wholly in favour of King James. So to curry King James's favour, he has this, uh, this famous simile and metaphor, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it, which is a direct reference to the medal that King James had produced um, to celebrate his survival of the gunpowder plot. Uh, so you can see it here, and here the plotters are represented by the snake, and the innocence of the Stuarts and the monarchy represented by the flowers. So Shakespeare is doing this as an obvious form of flattery of King James, uh, but also as a way to say, look, I'm completely loyal um, to you, and uh, therefore do not treat me with any kind of suspicion. Well, why would Shakespeare worry about being treated with suspicion? Well, he grew up with Christopher Marlowe, um, who was murdered, uh, what's this, 23 years, uh, sorry, 12 years before, uh, in 1593, he was arrested for being an atheist, and then was murdered, and many people think um, politically assassinated by the king's agents, or the queen's agents, as it would have been then, on the 30th of May. Um, so Shakespeare would always have felt vulnerable to political intrigue uh, and even to losing his life. Uh, did Shakespeare know the 1605 gunpowder plotters? Well, there's a lot of documentation which suggests that uh, he would have met them. He certainly went to exactly the same pubs that they went to. London was a small place then. Um, and his god, uh, the godparents to his children were also known to be Catholics. And um, it's pretty certain that Shakespeare's father was a Catholic. And many people ask themselves, well, is it likely that Shakespeare himself wasn't? 
Um, so this play is a way of Shakespeare distancing himself from any appearance of being Catholic and certainly distancing himself from any possibility that he might be seen as unsympathetic to King James. So what we've got here now is a business plan. This play is a way for Shakespeare to say, look, I'm going to celebrate you, King James. I'm going to show what brilliant ancestry you've come from. I'm going to also advise you subtly about what kind of king you should be so that your descendants will rule forever. And I'm going to celebrate you to show you how loyal I am to you. Uh, so perspectives that I imagine you haven't been taught as you've read this play. Uh, I didn't make it under 30 minutes. Typical English teacher talks too much. Uh, never mind. Congratulations uh, for sticking with me to get your grades eight and nine. If you're new to my channel, thank you uh, ever so much. Please consider subscribing because all my videos are aimed at getting the top grades and uh, you will definitely achieve brilliantly if you follow my advice. And just think about this. How much more have you learnt in 36 minutes than you would in a one hour lesson? Anyway, thanks for watching and goodbye.